Hello and welcome back to another Arthurian Legend video. Today's topic is Sir Ector the Kind, the foster father of King Arthur, the father of Sir Kay, and one of King Arthur's most loyal knights of the Round Table. Sir Ector is by far one of the least well-known and most often misrepresented characters in Arthurian Legend. So today we will be breaking his character down a little bit and learning the truth. So let's just dive on in. So before we go any further, I want to address an elephant or two in the room. The first thing I want to clarify is that we are talking about Sir Ector Bon Mason and not Sir Ector de Maris. Both are Knights of the Round Table, so to prevent any confusion, I just want to clarify that we are 100% only talking about King Arthur's foster father. The other elephant in the room, which is currently breathing down my neck, is the mischaracterization that Sir Ector often gets. So let's clear that up first. In many adaptations of the King Arthur story, especially his early years, Sir Ector is represented as being a bad father figure, for the most part. Most famously in Disney's The Sword in the Stone, where Arthur is raised as his ward and not as a son, and he is also treated very poorly, often being physically and emotionally abused. And that is outside of the time spent where he is being treated as little more than a slave. This is as far from the truth as his depiction could be. In Arthurian legend, Sir Ector, or by variation King Ector, depending which source material you use, was a loyal servant to King Uther Pendragon for many many years. And so, when King Uther impregnated a grain of Cornwall with the help of Merlin's magic, Merlin required as payment for his services that he be given the child that would come of this union, so he could raise the child as he saw fit. King Uther Arthur agreed to this arrangement, and when Arthur was born, he was immediately handed over to Merlin, who then chose Sir Ector to raise him, as he was Uther's most wise, loyal, honorable, and kind bannerman. However, it was of the utmost importance that Arthur's identity remained a secret to everyone. So Sir Ector agreed to raise the boy as his own, with no idea if he was in fact really King Uther's son. In the original source material, Arthur was not a ward to Sir Ector, nor was he raised as a foster son. He was raised as Sir Ector's son. Sir Ector never even hinted that Arthur wasn't really his son, so Arthur believed that Sir Ector was his father. Sir Ector never treated him any worse or differently than Kay. Sir Ector had Arthur trained in all the knightly arts and had him educated in history, science, mathematics, and logic. And he would even take Arthur with him on hunting trips and to tournaments, just as he would take Kay. There is never a reference to Arthur being mistreated while living at Ector's castle near the Forest Sauvage. In fact, the material says that Arthur had a very decent childhood and even his adolescence, and he learned most of what made him great from Sir Ector. This helps to explain why King Arthur was mostly seen as a wonderful king that was beloved by the nobles and the common folk alike, whereas his father, King Uther, was widely despised by many, and often ruled through fear and intimidation. Sir Ector would go on to raise Arthur as his son for 15 years, before the famous Sword in the Stone incident. It was at this time, with Kay being 17 and Arthur being 15, that a great tournament was called to determine who would become High King of All England. This tournament was supposedly either in London or, in most of the earlier works, Winchester. But in either case, it was to be very well attended with all of the best knights competing for the crown. In preparation for this, Kay was knighted so he could compete. And as a large and strong young man, with far above average prowess with the sword and lance, Sir Ector believed that his chances of winning were actually pretty good. As Arthur was not yet of age to be considered a man grown, he was not knighted, but instead was to serve as page or squire for his brother Kay, so they left for the tournament. I'm not going to recount the entire story of the Sword in the Stone here, but in short, Sir Kay forgot his sword and asked Arthur to go retrieve it from their residence. When Arthur could not get in, he saw the Sword in the Stone, and he pulled it out and he brought it to Kay. Kay took Arthur to Sir Ector, who brought them both back to the stone and had the sword placed back in it. After both Sir Ector and Sir Kay attempted to pull the sword free to no avail, Arthur once again easily pulled it out. Sir Ector then bowed before Arthur and hailed him as the rightful king of of all England. Sir Kay followed suit. Sir Ector then told Arthur how he had been entrusted to raise him by Merlin, and that his real father was King Uther. Arthur was overwhelmed by the knowledge, but even knowing the truth, accepted Sir Ector's oath, and bid him to stand as his father, and called for Kay to rise as well as his brother. Sir Ector was therefore the first of pretty much everything for young King Arthur. He was the first person to witness Arthur drawing the sword from the stone, which he would have to do many times after this just to prove that he could. He was the first person to swear fealty to Arthur, and was therefore for the first of Arthur's knights, and in the coming wars, he was the first of Arthur's bannermen to call up his troops to fight for King Arthur's cause in the war against the Eleven Kings. At this time, Sir Ector was already an old man of nearly 70 winters, and although still being strong, tall, 
and proud, he was well past his prime, but that did not stop him from serving his king. He commanded broad lands in England, namely a large estate in London as well as three large and wealthy fiefs in the country, two of which were in Wales and one in Wessex. As such, Sir Ector had a great amount of wealth, power, and men at his disposal, and very early on he put them at King Arthur's disposal. Without this initial support, it is unlikely that King Arthur would have garnered the support that he did. Sir Ector was able to call up a force and bring nearly 10,000 men to Arthur's side, of which there were nearly 300 knights, 2,000 assorted cavalry, 5,000 archers, and some 2,500 foots, a substantial army which would only grow, in part to the respect that many of the nobles of Wales, Cornwall, and Wessex had for Sir Ector. So the impact that Ector had on Arthur's campaign, especially early on, cannot be overstated. Sir Ector would go on to fight in and help Arthur win all of the battles that would take place before Arthur was recognized as the High King of all England, and as such, a loyal and trusted man would be the first knight to take a seat at Arthur's round table when he would receive it. There is little information in any of the source material for what Sir Ector did for the rest of his life. However, we do know a few more things. Sir Ector would serve in Arthur's court for at least 10 years after joining the Round Table, and that he would primarily reside in London, as he was a longtime advisor to the king, especially after Merlin vanished after being trapped inside a crystal by either a Lady of the Lake or Morgan Le Fay, depending on the story. We also know that Sir Ector was the oldest knight to ever be a member of the Round Table. When Sir Ector died of natural causes at the age of 82, he would be buried in the Royal Cemetery in Camelot, or Winchester depending on the tale. Sir Ector served Arthur loyally without ever asking much of him. At the time that he swore fealty to Arthur, he asked only that his other son, Sir Kay, be made Arthur's seneschal, which Arthur agreed to do, and Sir Kay would hold that office for the remainder of King Arthur's life. There are also certain stories that say that as payment for caring for King Uther's son, King Uther granted Sir Ector three castles, as well as nearly doubling his existing estate's size. This detail is not universal, but does help to explain how at the time of the Great Tournament, Sir Ector was one of, if not the most powerful noble in all of England. As far as modern media is concerned, like I said previously, Sir Ector is usually not portrayed accurately. However, a few honorable mentions are the 1963 Disney movie, The Sword in the Stone, where Sir Ector is voiced by Sebastian Cabot. In this movie, he often mistreats Arthur, but still shows care for him, both when he scolds Kay for losing him at the beginning, and later when he makes K Arthur Kay's squire. And in the end, when Arthur pulls the sword from the stone, he does apologize for being as hard on him as he was, and he kneels and pledges his fealty. There is also the 1975 film, Monty Python and the Holy Grail, where Sir Ector is one of King Arthur's knights. However, in this movie, he is simply named as one of the knights killed by the rabbit of Kerbinog, and of of course, he shows up in the 1981 epic fantasy film Excalibur, where he is played by Clive Swift. Unfortunately, that is all there is to say about Sir Ector. He was a great knight and a lord that served his king loyally and loved him as a son. Without him, Arthur would have likely never become king. And even if he had, not being raised by Ector, he would likely not have been as good of a king. So he really is pretty important to the story when it comes down to it. What do you think? Do you like how Sir Ector is portrayed in movies like The Sword in the Stone? Or would you prefer the version that we get in Arthurian legend? Why don't you let me know in the comments section? But in any case, thanks for watching and have a nice day, and I'll see you next time.